Cornerstone family. Welcome to today's service. If you're new to Cornerstone Church, thank you for joining us. We would love to help you get connected. If you're in person, please pick up a connection card from an usher and drop it in the offering. Or if you're watching over live stream, click on the I'm new button to find the form. Here are today's announcements. In Psalm 127, the Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord. Child dedication is a meaningful statement of gratitude to God for our children and our acknowledgement as parents that we need the Lord's help. Dedicate your children to the Lord Thanksgiving weekend on Sunday, November 26th during our church services. Sign up at the children's lobby or contact the church office for more information. Ladies, our Christmas tea is in two weeks. There are still a few speaker only tickets available for $10. Childcare is still open, but registration is required. Don't forget to tell your guests. This is a full event, so please consider carpooling as parking will be very limited. Come dress as you please, and we can't wait to see you on Saturday, December 2nd at 11 a.m. Thank you again for being here today. To sign up for any of the events you heard about today, please go to cclb.org slash sign up. We hope today's service will be a time of encouragement and edification to you. Please join us as we begin our worship. Love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all pain. 
Amen. Let's pray together. God, as we just got to sing about, there are many, many things to be thankful for. As we approach Thanksgiving, may you be the object of our thankfulness, Lord. First and foremost this morning, we're grateful that you've gathered us. We're grateful that you've delivered us here to hear the preaching of your word and to lift your name on high. And Lord, as we approach this time of worship, may you rid our minds of distractions. Allow us to focus on you, focus on your son and what you've done for us through the sending of your son to die on the cross. God, may, may the message that is preached by Pastor Jerry this morning be um, convicting to us, but also encouraging. Uh, may it orient our, our hearts and minds towards you. Um, may the words that he uses to deliver your message be words that are from your word, uh, spoken by you through him. Um, Lord, equip Pastor Jerry with boldness and conviction as he presents your word to us, Lord. God, as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings to you, um, allow us to do it with generous hearts, uh, to humbly give to your kingdom, Lord. And as we give, uh, may the money that is given be used to further your kingdom, to, to reach the lost, and also equip the saints here for your ministry. Lord, you know where the money will go. Pray that you guide it and direct it. And God, again, we're thankful for the sacrifice of your son and the reason why we gather here this morning. It's in your son's name that we pray, amen.
love to worship your holy name. Lord, teach us to be better worshipers of you. And Lord, help us to not be ungrateful, Lord, to be grateful servants for you. Lord, to be people that love you, honor you, glorify you. Let's stand together as we sing this song as a preparation for our Thanksgiving week.
It will not be shocking in heaven, but it will be surprising when we get there. The surprise, one of them, will be how much of what went on in this life was God at work in and through you, and you didn't even see it. Because if God wasn't at work, if God took his hand off this world, you think it's bad right now? If he just removed a little bit more of his directive hand, his sovereign will, this world would careen completely out of control. And we will worship and praise him and give him glory and honor. It's going to be one of those things where you just go, yeah, now I see it clearly. Even the things that you've done that are good, you'll say it was the grace of God working through me. Yes. And you'll give him glory. Well, it's great to be back today with you. You know, the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Isn't that a wonderful promise? And we all know something that sometimes that, little, that gap gets a little bit too, too big. And so coming together in worship is like closing the gap with God. You're drawing near to him, and guess what? He'll draw near to you. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So let him draw near. You purposefully, during this worship service, continue to, to draw near to him, and you'll discover that he is going to be right there for you and whatever your need is. You know, as this preparation for Thanksgiving, once again, thank God for a great country. Here we are worshiping freely in America. And we shouldn't we thank God for that? Isn't that a great thing? That is just such a great <laughs> gift, a great right. Our founding fathers knew what they were doing. And anybody that wants to mess with it is messing with wisdom. And so we need to hang on to and not let go of what has been bequeathed to us as Americans in this free nation, in this nation blessed beyond any other nation in history uh, before us. Today, I wanted to also uh, take just a moment or two to thank God among all the blessings that I have, but let's thank God for each other. Let's thank God for Cornerstone Church. This is a very generous church. Yes, it is. An amazing church. I, I don't know another church like this one, honestly. Um, this last um, month, you have been putting together these um, Operation Shoe Boxes, you know, these Christmas boxes for kids. And this year, over 1,400 of those are going all over the world. Over 1,400 boxes going all over the world. And inside those boxes are gifts that for some children, they never get anything. Mom and dad can't afford it. They're too poor. And that gift will come to them, and they will open it up, and they'll see all those little things that you've put in those boxes, and they'll rejoice. How many of you were in the, the, the packing? There was one of those Sunday afternoons, and we did some packing. Yeah, there's a few of you here that had, didn't you have a great time? Didn't your kids have a wonderful time? Or grandkids? It, was, it really was wonderful. So 14 hundred of those. And those of you, thank you for those who packed those boxes, but also thank you for those of you who made it possible this year in Long Beach, the poor, we have poor around here, don't we? We do. You know how tough it is. Go to the grocery store. Try to feed yourself these days. Try to get an apartment. Try to get something to cover yourself. It's difficult here. And Cornerstone Church, thanks to you and your giving, 230 families will have a beautiful Thanksgiving meal this year. Here's some pictures of our, our team going out to the various schools. And we earmarked, we asked the principals of these public schools in some of the most needy areas of Long Beach to earmark families that need help, and they did so. And That's the chairman of our board, Matt Hammond, who is there with some of those principals. He, formerly being a principal in uh, the Long Beach Unified School District, was there to uh, pass them out. That's such a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then finally, I wanted to uh, thank God for the return of Habtamu, our missionary international pastor, to uh, Africa and Asia and all over the world to train pastors. And I just want you to know he came home safely. 
Uh, thank God for that. And uh, he added another 6,000 pastors to the list of pastors that through you and through this church are being trained and being gifted and being equipped to serve the body of Christ, both in many African nations as well as in Southeast Asia. And so I'm very thankful. And next week, I promise you, I will show you a picture because our evangelist, Luke, who was a hospice nurse who just showed up in church on the Saturday night at one of our services, I got acquainted with him and I said, tell me more about yourself. He told me that he wanted to go back to his home country and preach the gospel in India. I said, wow, that's wonderful. And he said, I've been doing it now for a few years. Tell me about it, I said. And so he told me about it, and he was bankrolling the whole thing out of his own pocket as a hospice nurse. I said, well, I think this church would like to get behind you. It was the first time anybody ever got behind him. I want next week, I promise you, I'm going to show you a picture and it's going to move you because you'll see thousands upon thousands of people hearing him preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is thrilling and it's coming right out of this church and God is touching the world for Jesus Christ from Cornerstone Church. I thank him for that. That's a blessing for all of us to enjoy today. But before I get into the message of today, I wanted to take just a moment for a prayer, a very special prayer. All of us know that this world in which we live is very unstable and very fragile in these days of the war in Israel and the danger of this, I'll call it the Islamic death cult called Hamas that wants to destroy and kill every Jew on the planet if they could. This, this death cult is so, so toxic that not even any other Arab countries would be willing to take a Palestinian. Did you know that? They will not take them in because they know how caustic and how radical they are. Even though Egypt is close, even though Jordan is close, they said no, we're no to these people. That's how radical this is. And so we've seen the, the awfulness and the dismemberment and the murder and the rape and all the things that went on against innocent citizens. But on this Thanksgiving, when so many of your family will be around your table, and I pray that you will be with family, there are families in Israel whose loved ones are held hostage. These are just some of the faces of 240 from a 10-month-old baby, now 11 months old, can you imagine, to a, a woman even in her late, to, late 80s, taken hostage. And these people now, we don't know if they're living or whether they, they've been killed, but we should pray for their families. What a, think, put yourself in their shoes. Think of how you would feel about this, and you'd want the people of the world to pray for you and for your loved one, for their safe release. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me one more time. I'm going to ask you to stand. In this worship center, we support, we support what, what the righteous war that is going on right now to, uh, to rid the world of this kind of horrid uh, uh, atrocity. We should never, uh, the church during the 19, uh, late 1930s, even in Germany, did not stand against Nazism. I, for one, will stand against this kind of craziness in the world, and so should you. And so we as a church are going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, this is your will. For your word tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That, Lord, the people that you call the sons and daughters of Abraham, you said those who, who bless them, you will bless, and those who curse them, you will curse. And, Lord, your promises are unconditional. And so, yes, while the government of Israel doesn't do everything right, and it is true, it is a fact, though, that this war is a just war. And there is a scourge upon the face of civilization 
that needs to end. And so, God, we pray, especially for not only the soldiers in harm's way, but the innocent civilians who are Palestinians. Lord, we pray for them as well, that they will find ways to safety, where they have to live, where they can't even utter the word that they don't support their government, lest they be killed. God, we don't know such tyranny, such backwardness in this country. But Lord, we hear and see those strands of people who are radicalized on our streets, in our universities, in college campuses, and it grieves our heart that they can be so ignorant and so wrong in the face of what we've seen in history and Nazism. God, we pray today for those families whose loved ones have been stolen from them, ripped away and taken to underground tunnels where, God, you only know what, what's happening down there. So we pray for the release of them. Lord, we pray for comforting this, these families and all of Israel. Lord, you will preserve those people because you've said it. You've already determined it. It is your will. But Lord, this is a crisis moment in human history. And so we pray that the church will stand strong and that we will stand on the side of what is right and righteous. So God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus while we give thanks for America and the stand we have taken as a country. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, as I said, this is a, uh, a wonderful Sunday preceding Thanksgiving, and because it is that kind of a Sunday, I want to do a little bit of, of, of preparation. I want your hearts to be ready to sit around a table, perhaps, with your family, or if you don't even have a family. I remember I broke my mother's heart when I was in university down here in Southern California, and I told her I wasn't coming home for Thanksgiving. That was the first blow, but the second blow was when I told her that I had my Thanksgiving dinner at Der Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> she literally cried, <laughs> thinking of her son, you know, standing in line, getting a kraut dog or something like that. Well, I could have gone a lot of places, you know, to uh, prepare you for Thanksgiving. I could have gone to some of those beautiful texts in the Bible, like the story of Jesus and the 10 lepers in Luke 17. You remember the story where these 10 men who were afflicted with an incurable disease came to Jesus and he healed all 10 of them. And he told them, go show yourself to the priests. In other words, this was, by the way, the fulfillment of the Mosaic law. And this had never been, this was on the books for a long time, had never been used before. He was presenting himself as the Messiah. Most people don't know that behind that miracle was more than just the miracle itself. It was Jesus declaring himself to be the Messiah. And the Bible says that only one came back to thank him. And one of the great questions of the Bible was when Jesus says, where are the other nine? I could have preached on that, but I'm not. <laughs> I could have gone to 1 Thessalonians 5.18, one of my favorite passages. It's just a little quip at the end. It says, it says in everything, give thanks. For this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. I love that. It doesn't say for everything. It says in everything. It's a big difference. And I could have spent some time helping you understand that, but I'm not going to do that either. <laughs> or I could have taken to James 1.18, a familiar text in the Bible. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shifting shadow, no turning. In other words, everything that's good in your life that you can point to and say, that's really good, 
If you took a string, you could tie it right back to the heart of God for you. Because that's the truth. Is that God is the giver of every good and perfect. I could have preached on that, but I won't. Or I could have gone to a very uh, familiar line that's repeated over and over in the Bible. In fact, I'm going to help you. We're going to repeat this together. It goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Okay, let's say it again. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Some translations say his loving kindness endures forever. And I probably would have had you say, okay, the Hebrew word is chesed. I would have had you clear your throat in church. (laughs) Because it's really about God's covenant love. God cannot deny himself. His his loving kindness, he made a promise to himself, the highest of all authorities, that he would continue to be merciful and good to us. I could have gone there, and we could have traced it all over the Bible, but I'm not going to do that either. What I'm going to do is I'm going to solve a problem that the Bible raises in Psalm 73, Psalm 73. So open your Bible to Psalm 73 because one of the most brilliant things about the Bible is that it gives us some amazing insight about life issues that have a way of confounding us or confronting us or causing us a little unrest. For example, have you ever been in a situation where you said, well, this is just unfair? I suspect that everybody here has been in that situation. You can't live life without coming to a place, having a circumstance in your life, somewhere along the way where you go, well, that wasn't fair. And sometimes you just say, my life sometimes doesn't appear fair. Well, that's where we're going to go today. We're going to go to Psalm 73, where Asaph really takes on this question. How can I be thankful? How can I be thankful when it seems that evil people have it so good? So let's go to Psalm 73, and you'll see it says, At the top, a psalm of Asaph. Who is that? Well, Asaph, who wrote Psalm 73, was a musician in King David's court about 3,000 years ago. (laughs) But his statement is as current as today. It's relevant. So as Asaph looked around him, he, he looked and saw what seemed to him to be that the good guys were finishing first, uh, finishing last, and the, the bad guys were getting ahead somehow. And for him, that was just deeply disturbing. It troubled him. So he wrote a song about it. And in this poetic style, he lays out, first of all, his conclusions. Have you ever read a book where it's a novel or something or a mystery, and you say, you know, I really want to know what happens at the end? No one does that here, right? You don't do that. Read the end of the story? Well, yeah, of course you don't. Well, that's what he does. Asaph is actually going to go to the final conclusions first. And then he's going to go back and retrace the problem and give you the solution. Okay? So let's look at the first verse. It says, truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Okay. So those are his two main conclusions. Number one, God is always good no matter how life might seem to appear. Appearances can be very deceiving. We know this, don't we? In order for one to really understand something, to get the real gist of something, you actually have to take a longer look at it. You have to go deeper. You have to take more time to actually discern the truth about it. It's, just a lot of, it's like this. You can't go to a movie and watch one frame and say, I got that. I understand the movie. I, I got the whole plot. No, you won't get it. The same is true with life. If you take one isolated incident in your life and you draw all the conclusions from that, say it's a very unjust situation, You will turn out a bitter person, but the worst part is you will completely be deceived. You will not see life as it truly is. And so he goes to the conclusion, and he wants us to understand, yes, God is always good, no matter how it may appear. 
Second thing is, he said, um, God's goodness comes to those who are pure in heart. See, he wants us to understand something, and I think God wants us in our times to understand and to embrace this truth that those who are pure in heart, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's, that's a, one of the Beatitudes, is, is it not? And so the pure in heart, is that the way to go, or should we be the cunning, kind of, you know, living in the gray zone, trying to kind of whittle our way and wiggle our way and deceive our way and lie our way through life to somehow get it to our advantage. Or, as this conclusion gives us, it's better to be pure in heart. The truth is that it is better to be pure in heart. Always better to be pure in heart. As a matter of fact, purity and righteousness has its own reward. It's built in. You do things the way God wants you to do, and guess what? It'll turn out eventually in the right way. Conversely, if you choose to do things in an evil way and your heart is evil, guess what? It'll come out eventually. People will see it, and you will have to live with it, the terrible consequences of it. And so he is giving us these two final, kind of the, I'm going to put it this way, the final score of life. From God's uh, perspective, he makes sure that his children who are righteous, we finish on top. How do you like that? You win. Stay righteous. Live a good life. Live a godly life. You win. That's the conclusion. What a challenge, isn't it? But a great one for us. All right, so now... He is going to present the problem. Look at verse 2 and 3. Here's the big problem. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Why? Verse 3. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Whoa. Now, this was a big problem. Apparently, it was so big that Asaph almost threw his faith overboard. My feet had almost slipped away from God. So this is not just some sort of a intellectual problem. No, this was deeply emotional, deeply circumstantial, deeply spiritual. And that problem still exists today. You know, we live in a time when it's easy to feel disillusioned and disappointed with God because circumstances turn hard or turn against you. The options may seem limited when other people, you know, they just seem to be so carefree, enjoying life. It's enough for some people to lose their faith. Have you ever? I know it's scandalous. Heard of a pastor losing his faith? Yeah. Walking away from God. Shock. But the first, one of the first pastors I ever hired here walked away from God. He went to another church. I know it's really quiet in the room. He went to, it's true, I'm telling you. And he walked away from his family with ch four children, his wife. I'm telling you something. This is real. People get their minds all twisted. They're tormented inside. They conclude, they make the wrong conclusions. And they destroy their future. And they ruin other people's lives in the process. This is real. You say, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm good. I'm good as gold. No, you're not. <clears throat> Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Amen? I'm just telling him, stay humble. 
please stay humble before the Lord. You too can become a casualty. But the problem was he was looking out and he saw that these people who were operating by sight rather than by faith, they were getting ahead. They were morally compromised. They were away from God. And yet the righteous seemed to live such a hard life. You remember the story of Abraham and Lot. Remember the story back in Genesis, you know? Lot's this uh, nephew, and they stand there, and the land is laid out before them, and Lot looks out, and he says, and he operates by sight, not by faith, right? And he says, no, I'll take that well-watered plain over there. I think that looks good for me. Abraham says, okay, well, I'll take this more arid direction, and that's the way we'll go. And so they divided. What happened to Lot? who operated what? By sight. Abraham operated by faith. Lot ended up (laughs) being in the backyard of where? Sodom and Gomorrah, where God's judgment fell upon those people. You see, there is a difference in life. You must, and you were called to, operate by faith, not by sight. If you operate by sight alone, you will be tricked. You will be fooled. You will fall into the trap. But if you will walk by faith and obedience to the word of God, I guarantee you. No, I don't guarantee you. God guarantees it. You're going to turn out right. Not only for time, but for all eternity. But here's the problem. The problem with Asaph is he was looking at the outward, wasn't he? Verses 4 through 9, look at the outward impression he had of other people out there. He says, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds knows no limit. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of earth. The man of the world, according to Asaph, when he was looking at it, he doesn't have any cares. He has no limitations. He's independent. He's in control of all things. He's free to do anything he wants to do without any negative consequences. He is sleek. He is successful. He's the, remember that commercial, the Dos Equis man? (laughs) The most interesting man in the world. (laughs) If he were to pat you on the back, you would list it on your resume. Remember that? In, when in Rome, they do as he does. He is the life of parties he's never even attended. Yeah, when he bowls, he bowls overhand. You remember all that. He is the picture of the worldly man. It's all based on, listen to me, lies and deception. There are people in the world right now who last night attended a very fancy Cocktail party. Here in L.A., New York City, Dallas, you know, Chicago. And they went to these parties. And today, where are they? Home, sleeping off some kind of a drunk. And those parties were filled with banal people who have no purpose other than to promote themselves. How empty is this? Their life is literally nothing. It's like a, it blows away like a wind. But the way Asaph was looking at it, the person in the world, they boast about their accomplishments. They talk about the power to get their way. They go to the health, they look like they've been at the health club all day long, sleek body, pampered. They appear not to have ordinary problems that afflict other people. Their deodorant never fails. (laughs) Business contracts always fall in their favor. 
They employ other people to do all their dirty work. They're so self-assured, so authoritative. They wear pride around their neck like a necklace. They're all about them, and everyone knows it. They always get their way. Their dreams always seem to happen and come true. He has only to imagine something, and it turns out that way. And on top of all of this, they make light of God. They scoff at God. They, they, their mouths lay claim to heaven, and they take possession of earth. In worldly language, they're just, they, can, they, can, they can utter uh, epitaphs against God. They can, they can scoff at God, and they get by with it. That's what he saw. Now, if you looked at some people from that point of view, is he right? Yes, he is. Because that's what you could see. But now we're going to see what happens because um, these people are famous, but something is going to happen. Look at verse 10. Therefore, their people, their people turn to them and drink up their waters in abundance. What does that mean? It means that you watch people and people congregate around them, come to them, need them, follow them. They put their poster on their wall. They listen to their podcasts. They're on their Facebook pages. They're just drinking it all in. Give me more of what you are and who you are. Give it to me. I want it. This is what this is. This is what they look like. And then it says the verse 11, they say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge of this? This is what the wicked are like. They're always carefree. They're always increasing in wealth. This is the problem that he is stating here. And it kind of goes, he starts to blame God, doesn't he? Ever do that? Of course, you're all too good for that. But um, why God? Why God? Why this? We've all been there. That's the human heart. <laughs> Go back to Genesis, right? After the fall, what did, what did Adam say? It's that woman you gave to me. You gave to me, okay? <laughs> well, the Bible, don't you love the Bible? It tells the truth about us. But more than that, it reveals God and the great solution to our dilemma. Well, look at verse 13 and 14. He says, this is how I see myself. He says, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. This guy's really down, you guys. When faced with the injustice of worldliness, it's easy for godly people to feel cheated and empty. All of these questions flood Asaph's mind until he got a hold of himself, and that's where we're going next. Because I want to show you the way out of this dilemma. There are seven steps I'm going to point out as we do the rest of this psalm, how you can walk out of, because if you're in this mode right now, or you've been tempted in this way, or you've just kind of felt like God forgot me, or I'm like living my Christian life in vain, it doesn't seem to be working for me. I always love it when people come to me, I, and I give them counsel, and they say, they come back and they say, well, it didn't work. <laughs> Telling you, God always works. The problem was never God, it was them. God always works powerfully. Trust me on this. But here are the seven steps. Here's step one. Look at verse 15 and 16. If I had said, I will thus speak, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all of this, it was oppressive to me. Here's the first thing that you need to know, is that when you feel that way, do not spread it to others. That's what he's saying. Keep your eyes open, but keep your mouth closed. This is not the highest motivation in the world, but don't spill your negative emotions, your ingratitude, your desire to blame God and blame other people, to question the path of righteousness. Don't spread that around. And I'll tell you 
especially those of you who are around children or young people. They don't need this. Do you know what they're getting a lot in university these days? It's called critical theory. There you go. Boom. It hits it right there. Critical theory. It is spreading a sense of hopelessness and disillusionment and anger and hatred. That's what's going on. And no wonder our precious young people are on the streets. Well, let's move on to step two. If step one is don't spread this, step two is get next to God and start to engage your mind. Look at verse 17. He said, my, I, I, I got into the sanctuary, I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Did you just feel that something shifted in this passage? This is the pivot point, you guys. This is where it all changes. He says, okay, I had the wrong idea. I had the wrong impression. I was going down the wrong road. I was all messed up. I was down in the dumps until I entered into the sanctuary. I got next to God. I looked from his perspective, and I saw their end. I saw where this was going. It was open to me. I understood where all of this ends. Asaph went into the sanctuary. He got next to God, and suddenly his whole perspective changed. His vision of reality had been clouded by the world around him, by the appearances of the world's perspective. And I know it because I live in this world. Culture and all the media, it's very powerful to push us, to squeeze us, to make us to think the same way. That's why you, we come to church. Do you know what this is? This is a session on reality, on truth. And that's why you're drawn here. That's why we need to be together as the people of God. So we get hold of truth again, opposed to the lies and deception that we hear every day in the world. I remember listening to the late philosopher, Christian philosopher, Francis Schaeffer, who taught this principle. I thought it was such a, such a great principle. He says, whenever you hear of an ideology or a thought that's put out there, he says, just do this. Take it to its logical conclusion. Take it to where it goes. Let it go ahead and go. Find where that is all going, and then you will have the ability to truly evaluate it. Where does the world system go? You can't get, the, you can't get that answer by watching another episode of Jersey Shore. <laughs> they are the problem. You see what I'm saying? You know... John the Apostle, God bless them. I can't wait to meet him in heaven. He wrote this at the end of his life, you know, that little book, 1 John, where he keeps calling Christians like us, beloved, my little children. It's like, okay, here's a man who's lived life with Jesus, who walked and talked with him, who's now calling us beloved. By the way, when he started out, he was one of the sons of thunder. You don't want to mess with this guy. He had a bad temper. But Jesus changed all that. By the end of his life, he's calling everybody beloved. Do you see the transformation? You know what happened to that man? He not only was with Jesus, he was given wisdom and insight into reality. And he says to the church, love not the world, nor the things in the world. For he who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, we're dispensing a lot of knowledge in schools, universities, colleges across the country. But what we don't have is wisdom. 
This is wisdom. This is how to live your life. And so we come to this pivotal point in this passage. Get before God. See what the end of it all looks like. Step three, examine this final end. Take a closer look at it. Look at verse 18. Surely you place them. Uh Uh-oh, here comes the turning of the tables. You place those people that look so sleek, look so proud, are scoffing at everything that is righteous. You put them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they're destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. The whole world of it is on a false foundation. It's, Jesus talked about this, didn't he? He said, you know, some people build their life on a rock and some people build their life on sand. The world is built on sand. It all erodes, all goes away. Their dream, their fantasy turns into a horrible nightmare. God stands against them and will awaken them to reality. Imagine, bang! You step out of time into eternity, and now you see it, but it's too late. My friend uh, was the, for a time, was the security man for head of security of Hearst Castle, San Simeon. And I, he took us back behind some of the different places there and where the family, you know, tourists don't go and... It's not that fancy. It's, you know. But there was a lot of money spent there, right? A lot of money. But did you know William Randolph Hearst, he had one rule. All those fancy people, all those famous stars and everything that came there and politicians, he had one rule. Do you know what it was? Do not say or mention the word death. You think that guy was a little bit afraid? Yeah terrified. Step four, deal with the real problem. Okay, look at verse 21 and 22. This is amazing. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, in that state of bitterness, I realized something. I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. James chapter 1 says that the Bible is like a mirror, a perfect mirror, and you see yourself in it. Guess what Asaph saw? He sees himself. He looks at his own problem, and when he looks in the mirror, he sees the problem, and the problem is him. You say, oh, no, it's my wife or my husband. No, it's not. It's you. You. You're your worst problem. Can you say amen to that? Because that's the truth. You can be your worst enemy. Asaph saw it. Now that's reality. That's something the world will never tell you, to look in the mirror and look in your own heart and and let, let the truth begin to sink in. And so it is. He looked in his heart and he began to mourn over his own condition. He was like an untamed beast, destroying everything in its path. All right, step five, verses 23 and 24. He says, yet I am always with you, speaking of God, you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will take me into glory. Wow. See, you see, now he's coming around. You see this? And we all need to come around And realize and remember and be grateful to God for who he is. God is always present no matter how I feel, no matter what the circumstance is, no matter how dark it may become. God is the strength of my life no matter how weak I might feel in the circumstance. God has promised to guide me through life's difficult times. Thank you, God. I walk by faith with you. You're by my side. You're taking me by the hand. God's perspective gives me the wisdom I need to navigate this crazy world in which I live. And finally, this whole thing, God's plan, it ends up in glory. Is that nice? Praise God. 
The hope that we have as Christians never dies. Step six, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He got his eyes off of this temporal world, and he got his eyes finally to God to see him. And he realized something, and this is something that all of us should certainly embrace today. I'm just telling you, your final home is not where you live now. I don't care how good it is. It's not that good. <laughs> in fact, it pales because your final home is in heaven. My citizenship, Philippians chapter 1, is in heaven from whom I wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's my life. And so the final address is not my heavily mortgaged residence. <laughs> My final mode of transportation is not this uh, noisy old car I may have. Uh, my final body is not the one that is flabby and wrinkled and worn. The burdensome finances that cause us grief, that's not your true inheritance. God has made you for, for a new home. He has bought you with a price. You have a new inheritance. You have a new tr mode of transportation. He'll... He'll bring you there in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You know, we, we've all got this built-in aging mechanism. We are finite and temporary on this earth, but eternity is my destination. <laughs> Heaven is not only God's realm. I got good news for you, Christian friend. It's your home forever. Amen. Now, here's the last one. Verse 27, those who are far from you will perish. Mm. Boy, that's sobering. You will destroy all who are unfaithful, unbelieving to you. But as for me, it is good for me to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord God my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. You know, there's really no hope outside of heaven. Think about it. Just stretch your life out. Go ahead. Think about that. Think about taking it as far as it goes on this earth. Is there any hope in that one? Uh, -uh. there isn't. Because we're all going down the same pathway. We're aging, and then finally, this life is over. Ah, but pastor, you've taught us today to look beyond, to look to God. And that's the key. Because that one's filled with hope. That's the truth. And that's where you should live every single day, in the hope of everlasting life. No amount of worldly success, no amount of worldly possessions, no amount of intoxicating fame, nor, or mind-bending power can measure up, listen, to one day in heaven. One day. I'll exchange it all for one day in heaven. And then Asaph has this last word. Here's the, here's the parting shot. Verse 28, I will tell of all your deeds. This is a good place to end. He's basically saying, I need to get back to work. <laughs> I need to get back to serving God. I need to get back to putting my mind on what really matters for eternity. I need to get back to doing what is right before God. I need to be the most thankful person on this earth. And my brothers and sisters, there is no place on this earth where you can be more thankful than sitting at this table right here, the table of the Lord. For the God of heaven loved you this much that he sent his one and only son to die for your sins. Let me invite the elders and ushers to join me right now. Just come to the table. We are coming to the cross to remember what Jesus did for us there 
The God of heaven is a loving God, a merciful God. Yes, a holy God. But he is, thank him, a forgiving God. And we celebrate that in this meal. So let's bow our heads. And if you're in right relationship with God, you may partake of this. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're here even by live stream, you may want to go get a cracker and a little water or juice or whatever. Join us in this moment. Take time to worship as Jesus called us as his followers to do, to remember these things, his broken body and his shed blood. This is the moment. This is where it culminates of all the gifts you've ever been given. This is the greatest of all. Let's bow our heads and let's give thanks. Heavenly Father, we just, we just thank you so much for your love and your grace, Lord, that you would send your son to live a perfect life and to die for us, Lord. Lord, he, for your son to do something that we could never do, Lord, we remember, we thank you for the blood on the cross that washes away our sins, Lord, past, present, and future transgressions, Lord. And Lord, as this, at this time and in this season, as we take of this bread and this cup, we also think of those brothers and sisters that have not yet joined us at this table, and we pray for them, Lord. We pray that you have worked all things out for your goodness, Lord. We thank you and help us to remember this, this message today that even though we, our eyes may fail us, our faith will always endure, Lord, because your love is the love that endures forever, Lord. So bless our time, bless this cup and this bread. And we thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' mighty name, amen.
You cannot look into the portals of heaven. You simply cannot. Unless you see it through the lens of the cross. For even in heaven itself, the saints sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and blessing. And so, as we partake of this, we are looking through the cross, the shed blood of Christ, the broken body of Jesus. Yes, it was the way that God made to rescue us out of this horrid dilemma of sin and the world and the flesh and the brokenness of this life. There is a way. There's only one. It is Jesus. It is the cross. It is faith in him. Jesus said, this cup this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Do as often as you eat it. Remember me. Everything that God promised he guaranteed and he guaranteed it signed in blood the blood of the eternal covenant the blood of his son Jesus there is nothing more precious nothing higher nothing more permanent or eternal than this and that's why Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do as often as you drink it and remember me. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew that once the apostles, the followers of Jesus like you are here today, once they had taken the Last Supper, the Bible says they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. And from that point on, as we know, Jesus went to the cross and then three days later he rose in victory. Let's stand and let's sing the praises of God as we have now worshipped him the way he's asked us to.
Well, I pray that you will have a, uh, a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family and your loved ones. Um, don't write me if you're going to the Wiener Schnitzel for, <laughs> for Thanksgiving. Um, seriously, uh, try reading a psalm. Psalm 100 would be good. That's easy to remember, Psalm 100. Just, just read it. It's a psalm of thanksgiving that just kind of goes right across the board. It'll, it'll cover what you need to cover. And then if you remember, also remember the hostage families and pray for them and pray for our world. Pray for your family. Give thanks to God for all of its blessings that you've enjoyed and you continue to enjoy. Will you do that? Okay, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving.